I'm Silly Torp. How we would have loved to enjoy breakfast tacos, great keynotes, culture, face-to-face -face conversations, and the fabulous nightlife of Rainy Street, Austin. Still, we are so grateful that South by Southwest Online 2021 is filling our COVID-affected daily lives with inspiration. And we're all looking forward to being back in Austin next year. The brand new Munk Museum in downtown Oslo, a modern and thriving city, is quite a leap from the scenes you might have seen me in as Freya in Norseman on Netflix. <laughs> or in other series from our region. This museum, dedicated to the art of Edvard Munk, has yet to be inaugurated. And we have the honor of being here to present it to an international audience for the first time. We have managed to put together some great content and interesting themes from Scandinavia, which focus on business, finance, startups, art and MOOC, and last but not least, sustainability. Our first segment focuses on how unexpected collaborations may be key to finding solutions for a net zero emissions future. What kinds of surprises are in store if a leading industrial company partners with an all-electric car company, award-winning designers and wallpaper magazine? Over the last year, we've been developing a new kind of electric power delivery vehicle. Built in lightweight aluminium, it is a cleaner, kinder, more civilized way of moving things around. Okay, so getting straight into it, where do we see the biggest opportunity uh, for remove in terms of uh, end of use, but also uh, geographically? What could people do with it? The vehicle uh, was conceived as a, some kind of cargo um, transporter, much smaller in scale than, than a little lorry, and uh, kind of designed for um, shorter distances, the, the type of last mile delivery. We did think about um, cities, first of all, but I think it came clear quite soon in the project that rural areas, um, countries with a completely different infrastructure could uh, also become interesting for, for this idea of transportation. That's the beauty of electrification, that you actually can, with a very well, simple technology in a way, enable um, transportation that was before not possible. The combustion engine always needed quite a, quite a lot of um, vehicle around it, and now suddenly you can strip it down to the bare necessities again. One of the evident upsides with the electric drivetrain is that there's nearly no maintenance. I mean, whether, you know, it's not about roadmasking the idea of that, you know, tinkery behavior of, you know, taking down the motor on a, you know, during the weekends. Yeah. It's it's the simplicity of not needing to 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 tinker with it with the, the, the bike, which is great, the way I see it. Exactly. And I think one of the things that I love about the, the project and this design is how, you know, how much potential there is for people to adapt it and, and customise it in ways that even uh, even we haven't thought of yet. Speaking about this this kind of open system that we are creating, I, I, I want to remind that the project really started with um, the material from hydro, and a, a, and a technology that allowed us to make, to build a very lightweight but strong platform. And that's how the project started. No, I think it's, it's, a, it's a great material for this kind of vehicle, actually. But, but I think it's so important for us as, as a, let's say, materials supplier to, to be involved early on, because it's really in this design phase where we really work together that we can make sure that, that the concept that we develop has the lowest possible you know, impact, CO2 impact. And if I can add also, I think you also made a really good choice in pairing Polestar with uh, Hydro, uh, who is an aluminium uh, producer, because we see the huge impact that our material choices have in terms of how, um, how it's going to affect the climate, the product. We often talk about batteries as being really important to focus on. Of course they are, but we also really need to see more sustainable aluminium, more sustainable steel. And this is also 
where I, I just realize more and more that we are so interconnected. We really need each other in terms of, in order to fulfill our climate goals. We are fully reliant on, on working with good partners. Otherwise, we can't do it. This is only the beginning. We always say, come on, electromobility on our zero zero emission mobility journey is just the entry ticket. I, I think now we do the electromobility step and then we have to focus, refocus and say, come on, that was only the beginning. Now we really have to look at the whole chain, production, materials going in, and then of course, um, what, what materials we design with. And this is, I mean, this stage is so much more exciting than the last 20 years when designers were busy making things pretty. I wanted to end by talking about coll collaboration to everyone really. And um, because I mean, this project has proved it to me is that there is something really powerful about unexpected, kind of unexpected or, or collaborations. This is what's been great with wallpaper and, and this project is that you have gathered together perhaps a group of people that would not normally work together in this capacity. And, and I really do think that that is the future of, of, uh, of not only e-mobility and, and e-mobility development, but all type of products that needs to be designed for a more, for more circularity or, or to, to, to be better, <laughs> you know, in terms of sustainability. I really, I felt like when you were talking about it, it's a little bit like, um, yeah, we, we all have our, you know, band where we play our music and do our stuff. And this was really like a jam <laughs> session where you, you know, for, yeah. one, for one evening you bring, bring the musicians together in a very new constellation and everybody brings this instrument and we just kind of play something unexpected. Free jazz. <laughs> I think um, I, I, I liked uh, uh, Thomas's uh, image of the jam session. And I, I think <laughs> that the whole project wouldn't have happened had we come together with a real plan, a strategy of building a vehicle to be launched, this and that. Um, I think it, it had to happen like it did with a phone call from you, Nick, to me, connecting me to Hydro, you know, first conversations with, with Hilda and you, and just kind of in a, in a naive, we, none of us is naive really, but, I think this kind of very light start of the project. For my part, I mean, I've just been astounded by the generosity of people and the, the time and the energy and the thought and the commitment that people have offered to something that, you know, um, may or may, <laughs> may not help change the world. But, you know, it, it just it's just on that level and everybody's been very lovely. And on that level, the, it's, you know, this kind of collaboration is such a, a kind of joy and a learning thing. And, and, and uh, so I wanted to thank everyone um, for, you know, in the, in the way they've taken part and, and committed to this. Okay, I think, I think that's, we're all done. So thank you for everyone. Thank you, everyone. If you would like to connect with Hydro and Polestar to understand their collaboration better, they will be present at a Q&A tomorrow. This event is titled Rethinking Mobility and you'll be allowed to submit your questions directly to their top executives and key members of the project. Edvard Munch's painting, The Scream, is one of the world's most famous and recognizable images. Later this year, Edvard Munch will move into his new home in the downtown center of Oslo. The new Munch Museum will become the number one destination for you to experience Edvard Munch's life and art. The director of the Munch Museum, Stein Olaf Henriksen, will be in conversation with Kristin Skogenlund, CEO of Shipstedt.
Kristin, thank you so much for joining me in this conversation about art and business today here from the Munch Museum in Oslo. It's a pleasure. And I have to ask you now, since we're sitting in the 12th floor of the new Munch Museum in Oslo, do Munch mean anything to you? Do you have a relation to Edvard Munch? And his I art? absolutely do. And I think especially the, his painting Sick Girl has always fascinated me because he has such a dramatic and, and tragic in many ways life story, losing his sister, losing his mother, you know, the people he, he was the most attached to. I never had that experience, but to 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 be able to access, let's say, the pain uh, that is expressed through his paintings about that has always affected me a lot. So I'm proud of Munk as a Norwegian, and he has certainly reached uh, in, in, you know, into my feelings a lot with his art. Well, that's very nice to hear. And I think that this work that you're mentioning was the first work that really made a scandal uh, when Munk was a very young artist, uh, sick girl with his technique and his very heavy break with the tradition at that time. So I think that means a lot to a lot of us. So thank you. And and you are very successful in, in businesses and have been uh, heading a lot of important companies in Norway. Uh, and now you are CEO of uh, Shipstest and uh, you still have uh, some interest in uh, in the arts, being uh, chairman of the board of the Oslo Philharmonic, another very distinguished, let's say, cultural institution in uh, Oslo, Norway. What do you think is valuable uh, being chairman of that uh, very important institution? Oh, I take immense pleasure in being involved with the orchestra. And, and actually, I choose that above, for example, having a similar position in, in another company. For me, it's a diversity in it. It's something about learning from other sectors. Uh, the Oslo Philharmonic Orchestra is also about facilitating performance at the really high level, although through an, an artistic expression rather than a, a, a business process. And I see that, you know, with my experience, I can contribute to them, but I also learn an immense lot from being involved in that type of high quality, high performing institution within the arts. It's, it's very, very uh, giving for me. Yeah, I think you're very right in that we can learn a lot from each other, from the culture sector and then in the private sector. Uh, and I know that you frequently go to concerts and even you have been singing in a choir. Is that yes. right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Don't so ask me to sing, though. <laughs> so art means something for you in your life as well. I mean, apart from the strategic uh, and learning experiences. No, absolutely. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I love music, obviously, uh, but I also love different art forms. Uh, I love to, to go to the ballet. I, I love to go to art museums and just contemplate. And I think maybe because my general life is very busy and I'm also quite a lighthearted person. I don't sort of dwell that much. I, I have a need to sometimes let myself go to the more melancholic aspects of life. And I find that through art. It extends my, my life and my senses somehow. But do you think uh, private business has a lot to learn from uh, from the culture sector? You mentioned the high quality of the Oslo Philharmonic. For example, in an orchestra, but also in any type of uh, artistic ensemble, basically, you have these amazing uh, art and craftsmanship of making things play together in perfect, be it harmony or contrast or whatever, and where each individual performer might not seem that significant, but plays such an essential part to make that holistic experience. And that is not unlike what we do in any type of business process or, or value chain, you know? So I think there, there you have these similarities. And I have to say also, I'm very taken by people who live off their talent directly. There is something that is very exposed about that. It's very vulnerable. And, and also, you know, and the instant feedback that's embedded in the arts, I think also that's something that we can learn a lot from, uh, from the business perspective. Yeah, I also think we have a lot in common. For example, now, obviously, Munch has a very global perspective. And we are sending out our art experiences in the digital fashion these days. And we have actually reached out to more than 100 million people over the few, uh, last few months. Uh, and I think that you in Chipset also have a very heavy global perspective and ambitions, I, I presume. So, so could you say something about how you uh, encounter that in terms of uh, challenges, possibilities? 
our mission in Shipstead is actually to empower people in their daily life. And I think, you know, for the arts, that's also about empowering people in, in, you know, in their daily lives. And I believe that uh, by using technology for the good of it, and being able to reach a lot more people, uh, lower the threshold for people to enjoy the arts, to, to, to have different experiences, which is quite similar to what we're trying to do within our media and, and marketplace space as well. There are similarities. And, uh, you know, for example, for Munk, you know, he can now be enjoyed in, in various ways and, and sort of without borders, right? And, and you can really lower the threshold for people to experience his genius. And it's not as a substitute to visiting and seeing um, an actual uh, painting by Munch, but it's an extension of the possibility of experiencing him. Probably together with the Oslo Philharmonic is our best cultural export article, isn't it? And we want the world to be able to enjoy it. And I think it's great that you do that. Munch, Munch means a lot to people all over the world. And when we do these interactive um, uh, sendings uh, out, we get uh, so many interesting questions back from people in every corner uh, of the globe. Since the corona hit and we can't hold any concerts, we turned more digital and with the result that we reach more people than ever. It's not quite the same as enjoying a concert live, but it certainly is a way to reach out to more people. Well, thank you, Christine, for, for joining this conversation. It's been wonderful talking to you. And uh, we see you again, of course, when the new Monk Museum opens as uh, one of our uh, guests. So. Have a nice time and thank you so much. Thank you. As early as 2017, the city of Oslo published its climate budget alongside its fiscal budget. And already last year, an astonishing 63% of all private cars purchased in the capital was fully electric. No wonder Will Ferrell in a recent commercial during the Super Bowl wanted to challenge us and our EVs. <laughs> in this last segment, uh, of this Scandinavian session, we will find out more about why Oslo is leading the sustainable shift and what we can expect as the city is moving forward. I know that many here with me would love to be in Austin right now, dancing at the White Horse and eating breakfast tacos. But we are at the second best option. We are here at the Munch Museum in Oslo, Norway. And Oslo is the place to look to when you are interested in Nordic business models and sustainable solutions. Actually, Norway is the second best in the world when it comes to gender equality. And Victoria, you're the vice mayor for business here in Oslo. How does this affect your work? Well, thank you, Steve. I I would go as far as to say that it would not be possible for me to have this job if it weren't for the Nordic model. Um, I have a little uh, daughter, she is one and a half years old, and when I was offered this position, she was three months. Uh, so um, I was able to uh, fulfill my parental leave, uh, paid parental leave, I would add, um, with her at home and uh, uh, returned to work when she was six months. And then her father took over at home and we split the parental leave 50-50. Uh, and I think that uh, the Nordic model makes it possible for both men and women uh, to have top jobs and a family life. It makes the uh, work-life balance possible. And I would also like to add that 70% of all fathers in Oslo take out at least 15 weeks of paid parental leave, reflecting the increased uh, equality with regards to childcare. And why is that important? Well, we need both sexes uh, in the workforce. Uh, women in the workforce are extremely valuable to us as a society. It's actually more valuable than the sovereign fund. And also it's important for the work-life balance for both sexes. I would also like to add that when the child is one year, uh, you have a legal right to kindergarten. 
and um, as head of the public building sector, I'm really uh, concerned with building enough uh, kindergarten so that everyone uh, in Oslo can go back to work and have their kids safely put in the kindergarten, which is also really important to uh, a gender equal uh, society. And Molly, you're the director for technology and sustainability at ICT Norway. How does this uh, affect your work? First of all, I would say that in addition to all the things that uh, the vice mayor is mentioning here, also education in Norway is free, which is extremely helpful and, uh, and uh, a true blessing, to be honest. But uh, I'm a mother myself. I have three kids. All of them are in kindergarten. And uh, I don't think it would be possible for me to do my job either if it were for the welfare system that we have, which is kind of the Nordic model. What I also love is that uh, I get to raise my kids in a city who has been awarded many times for its work on sustainability. Uh, Oslo was named the European Green Capital in 2019. Uh, Forbes has named Oslo the third smartest city in the world. And also during the pandemic, uh, Oslo was named the number one country in the world for well-being. So I would say that as a mother, uh, I think it's, uh, it's... I love that we are able to raise our kids in a place who is... Uh, clean, green, smart, and also uh, sustainable. Victoria, what are your thoughts? Well, I, w I would agree with Molly, and cities are handling problems close to people, and our citizens expect us to solve uh, their problems or, uh, and deliver solutions. And we are seeing that cities are and regions are implementing actions more quickly than nations. And to launch the climate budget here in Oslo, uh, one, uh, uh, on top of our climate uh, strategy, we count uh, emissions like we do with the regular budget. And the city of Oslo has driven new product development by setting new standards and using innovative procurements such as zero emission building sites and fossil free machinery. Uh, but we can't do this alone. We have to collaborate with the industry to deliver the green solutions that the cities all over the world need. And uh, Molly, we discussed Oslo Innovation Week because that's a place we can actually come and see uh, all these solutions, right? It is. It is in September every year and we gather people from all over the world to come to Oslo to discuss and to uh, look and innovate and meet people. Come to Oslo in September. Uh, we'll show you around our city. We have the zero emission uh, uh, EVs here and also other transport uh, forms of transport. We have the circular, highly advanced uh, digital solutions for circular economy, and also we have uh, uh, we have floating solar parks uh, outside Oslo. So there is a lot to look at, and also come and take a look at uh, uh, our climate budget and the effects of it that we see every day here in Oslo. That's great. And if you would, could main mention one solution that uh, you have learned about recently, what would that be? Yeah, recently I found out about this startup called Material Mapper. And uh, Material Mapper, they won a hacking competition, the, hack the global hack the crisis competition. And what they do is that they use satellite uh, data to make an overview of all the construction sites in Oslo where they are touring buildings down. And this technology, they, um, they, they use uh, machine learning to uh, gather and sell construction uh, waste uh, that can be used in a circular economy way to make uh, new buildings and other valuable stuff. That's great, thank you. And if you'd like to know more, then come to Oslo Innovation Week. And I'm looking forward to seeing you all there. That was all we had from today's Scandinavian session, but we'll be back tomorrow with more interesting themes. The CEO and executives from the world's largest sovereign wealth fund, the Norwegian Oil Fund.